Let me now start this, this uh, uh, overview of sans in, in ancient India. It's hardly an overview because while I was preparing it, I realized that if I was going to list all the achievements of the mathematicians and the astronomers in a kind of chronological, you know, textbook kind of manner, however interesting it would be because many of you may not have been exposed to it, uh, still it would not serve my purpose. So I decided to kind of deviate and um, include quite a bit of discussion on Indian science and uh, also some peripheral issues which are not strictly speaking uh, uh, centrally scientific, but actually uh, you, this is to make you feel and understand that our, uh, in, in classical India, as in many ancient civilizations, the borderlines between science, philosophy, science, spirituality, uh, were, were not always uh, very, you know, sharply defined. Rather, they were uh, loosely defined and uh, we will find a lot of cross-border, if I may say so, influences. Um, and it is important to understand the, if we can try to read the minds of the ancient Indian scientifics, this is very helpful. So, so with this, let me start. This is an artistic uh, uh, imaginary representation of Brahmagupta uh, with uh, one uh, of his manuscripts. Of course, not the actual manuscript. It is, you know, manuscripts were copied again and again uh, because in India manuscripts usually have an average lifetime of two to three hundred years. You can't usually expect more than that occasionally sometimes. Uh, so there is, there's been a tradition and this is in fact, uh, first of all, we should express our gratitude to all the unknown, forgotten, unnamed Indian scholars who have painstakingly copied those manuscripts uh, over uh, centuries, sometimes millennia. And uh, <clears throat> of course, in the process, it does happen that manuscripts sometimes get a little corrupt because the copyist is not always fully conversant with the topic and may accidentally introduce errors of language or even once in a while his own opinion uh, so that, um, uh, you know, those who have published what we call the critical editions of, if you take a, a, a text like this, say, uh, Brahmasputta Siddhanta, uh, which is the a monumental work of Brahmagupta on all kinds of topics, algebra, geometry, astronomy, and so on. Uh, well, you need to really have a good, reliable critical edition. You need to have as many possible manuscripts as, as you can get from all the manuscript repositories in India, and then uh, compare them, decide which one is more authentic, and, and you know, collate them in a very rigorous manner. So this is what is known as a critical edition. Uh, please keep in mind also, before I go into the topic, that we have, according to one estimate by David Pingree, uh, American um, scholar, especially of Indian astronomy, or of astronomy in general, um, who spent a long time preparing a catalogue of Jyotisha manuscripts, manuscripts of astronomy and astrology, but mostly astronomy, in ancient India, uh, he published this, I think, in five volumes, a huge uh, reference. But his estimate of the manuscript wealth in India was in the range of 30 million manuscripts. And out of that, we have only looked at a few lakhs. I'm talking about all possible manuscripts. Uh, we have only looked at a few lakhs. So um, if I may take another example, in uh, Tamil Nadu and Kerala, we have a more rigorous estimate by a scholar, K.V. Sharma, who passed away a few years ago, uh, who did prodigious work himself, and he catalogued all the, he rather inventoried all the manuscript of scientific texts, scientific texts available in uh, uh, repositories of manuscripts in Kerala and uh, Tamil Nadu, and he found that only 7% had been published. So he said, we are judging, in fact, the output of Indian science by just the seven person that happened to have been published. The, 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 the other manuscripts are lying there, but we don't have you know, people to read them. We don't have scholars. The, the field has been so depleted. Indian academic institutions have so consistently, so consistently ignored uh, this important field of history of science that we, we have very, very few scholars left. And, uh, 
uh, that is why uh, you know when you attend high level uh, uh, conferences seminars of history of science in india you always come across the same scholars as for example those we had today there is the the, the field has become has shrunk terribly so this is unfortunate and I hope that efforts here at IIT Kampu, IIT Gandhinagar, other places will eventually help to revive the discipline of history of science, which remember is a mainstream discipline in some uh, Western universities, both in the US and in Europe. You can have a master's, you can have a PhD in history of science, but in India you can't, it's not possible. So, so this is just to show you that uh, uh, what, it is not as if we know much of what has really been done. But of course, probably some of the most important stuff. Now, <clears throat> let me start with two opposite estimates of Indian science by uh, Europeans. This one is by Voltaire, the great French philosopher of the 18th century. And he passes some remarks. I'll first read it. He says, it is very important to note that some 2,500 years ago at the least, Pythagoras went to Samos, from Samos, to the Ganges to learn geometry. This is actually according to late Greek sources. Mm, this is one uh, Iamblichus, uh, 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 Neoplatonist philosopher, uh, but who lived actually several centuries after Pythagoras. But he would certainly not have undertaken such a strange journey had the reputation of the Brahmin science not been long established in Europe. I am convinced that everything comes to us from the banks of the Ganges, astronomy, astrology, metempsychosis, etc. Now this is what is now known as a romantic view of ancient India because this was, um, first of all, in the absence of real textual knowledge. Voltaire had no access in his days. Uh, in fact, there was no European scholar who even understood Sanskrit in his days. It was just going to happen a few years later. Uh, number two, he was keen, and a whole wave of phil uh, European philosophers were keen to destroy Christianity. They wanted to uh, be free from the shackles, uh, especially intellectual shackles of Christianity, and they found that ancient Egypt, ancient China, ancient uh, India were very good sticks to beat Christianity with. You know, that you could tell the, 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 the Christianity that, you know, there were lots of glorious civilizations long before you came along. So, so actually this uh, a very rosy picture, which may have some elements of truth, I'm not actually going to discuss it, um, uh, is, is also a result of this movement. On the other hand, uh, something like 50, 60 years later, you have, and you may remember this quote from my lecture on education, uh, someone like Thomas Macaulay, a very powerful spokesman of, you know, the British colonial, I don't know if I can call it philosophy, but anyway, ideology, who writes, a single shelf of a good European library is worth the whole native literature of India and Arabia. Indian education consists of false history, false astronomy, false medicine in company with the false religion. So therefore, only European knowledge is going to be of any value and they don't even think of looking for science in ancient India. Now, after this, I can't go through the whole, uh, uh, you know, the whole evolution of, of discovery of Indian science, but uh, there were far less biased European scholars who came across uh, scientific texts. Of course, the first texts to be studied were the great uh, spiritual and philosophical texts, the Vedas, the Upanishads, the Gita, then the Mahabharata, Ramayana, and so on. That, of course, was the major interest to start with. But then they came across some scientific texts, and uh, <clears throat> you have people like Colebrook, who very early on, in the 1820s, uh, translated some chapters from Brahmagupta, some chapters from uh, 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 Bhaskaracharya. Uh, we will come across him. And, uh, uh, and then they realized that there was, there was apparently quite a lot of mathematics. But then the initial bias was that if Indians had so much of mathematics, it must have been borrowed from the Greeks. Because you see, the Europeans were under now the influence of the Renaissance, where the Greek heritage had been uh, not only acknowledged, but glorified in turn. And it was understood that you know, the Greeks were the creators of science, and there was no 
real science. They may have been scattered bits in Babylonia and Egypt before them, but no real science were the name. So therefore, the, uh, the Indians were uh, 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 immediately, implicitly charged with having borrowed all their science from... So, I mean, this, you know, it was a kind of a seesaw movement. And uh, it's only in the 20th century that more objective studies by Westerners of Indian science uh, began. And also, thanks to the beginning of Indian scholars that happened by the late 19th century, Indian scholars finally joining the field and finally looking at their own uh, scientific texts, uh, you know, after the, 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 the Europeans opened the field. Well, it often, often happened like that. But uh, today we have more reasonable, more fair estimates, though, though there are still lots of controversies uh, going around. But let me start with the, well, with the beginning and uh, with the Veda, as always. That's where we have to start when we want to study those uh, uh, questions. And there, in fact, we just had by Amartya uh, a brilliant, uh, much more brilliant uh, expose, expose of the uh, decimal system as it is present in the Veda, but I just took this hymn at random, and you see here in blue, or in the translation if you wish, how multiples of 10 are very commonly used. For example, here this is a hymn asking Indra to come. Of course, this is a metaphor, but let's not go into that. And he has to come with 2, 6, 8, 10, and then 20, 30, 40, etc., all the way to 100 horses. So whatever those horses may mean, the point is, there is an ease in playing with multiples of 10, which not all ancient civilizations had. For example, Babylonia would have stopped at 60 because their number system, the base of their number system was 60. So at, at 60, all, you know, the, the, everything was uh, sent back to zero. So they wouldn't have easily gone beyond in this way. They would have said 60 plus 10, 60 plus 20. Uh, then in, in the Rig Veda, in fact, this continues all the way to one lakh. And the Ajur Veda goes even much uh, beyond. It goes to the uh, uh, number known as the Pararda, which is 10 to the power of 12, so one, one million millions. And uh, all the intermediary multiples are named. They have actual names. I'll come back to this in a moment. Then a little later, uh, I have to only select a few points here and there. Uh, there are lots of elements of astronomy in the Vedic period, but they are scattered and they are semi-hidden by metaphors, legends, myths. Uh, we have, in fact, we had uh, today with us one very uh, brilliant scholar, Professor Aran Iyengar, some of whom you might have listened to him yesterday. Uh, he's done a lot of original research in this field. And some of the texts, for example, like this one, are reasonably clear he, it says the sun never really sets or rises. Having reached the end of the day, he inverts himself. Thus, he makes the evening below, day above. Having reached the end of the night, he inverts himself. Thus, he makes day below, night above. He never sets. Indeed, he never sets. So, they are quite insistent on the fact that this setting and therefore rising of, this, of the sun is a bit of an illusion. And uh, this probably means that they all already understand the, the sphericity of the Earth. And well, they're not telling us whether it is the Earth that rotates or whether it is the Sun that goes about. Okay, then let's not uh, try to extrapolate too much. But that concept is already there. And uh, this is a, a, a Brahmana, that is to say, one of the major commentaries on the Vedic Samhitas. Late, a bit later, or perhaps about the same time, dates are always difficult to establish, you have finally one major text, short text, it's about 40 or 43, according to which version you take, uh, 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 shlokas, called the Vedanga Jyotisha. So the, the, the astronomical uh, events that it refers to, for example, the sun, uh, uh, the winter beginning, uh, when the sun is in a particular nakshatra. So this helps you to date the event because of the phenomenon known as the precession of the equinoxes. As you know, the, the celestial sphere is rotating. It's not rotating. It is the earth that spins uh, the axis of the earth as a spin-top movement. And uh, this 
uh, one circle of this uh, axis of the Earth takes 27,000 years. So during these 27,000 years, the whole celestial sphere ap appears to rotate uh, completely around the Earth. And, uh, <clears throat> and because of this, such events, for example, the sun begins this constellation uh, when winter begins, so at a particular month which is named, uh, this will be datable because uh, after 3,000 years, for example, this will have shifted. So, so here uh, we, we know that the date is about 12 to 1400 uh, BC. And the, this short text is basically concerned, it introduces the notion of nakshatra. Actually, Yajur Veda also, which is the second Veda after the Rig Veda, Yajur Veda also had uh, the first list of the nakshatras. The nakshatras are basically constellations, they are not stars. You know, we are used to, when you visit a temple and you ask for your nakshatra, well, you take it as a star. But actually, strictly speaking, the nakshatras are the constellation covered by the path of the moon. This is, if you prefer, it is the lunar zodiac. It is, it is the constellations that the moon will be moving uh, uh, in front of as it goes about the earth. And uh, then, but then its major focus is about time division. And there it introduces a lot of elements which are not present in the earlier Vedic texts. Uh, like uh, concepts of seasons, concepts of uh, solstice, solstices, equinoxes, and so on. And uh, in many ways, the Vedanga Jyotisha remains the foundation of uh, India's traditional calendars. Uh, well, of course, reformed and uh, evolved in various ways through time, but uh, this, is, this is the foundation which has been preserved. Time, of course, is, has to be Me measured, divided, you have to introduce, you see, what, what are the natural components of, of time? The day, of course, the rising of the sun gives you a clock, and uh, then you have the moon. The moon, the phases of the moon are the next natural clock, and that is a clock which all ancient cultures have used, and that is why all ancient calendars, without a single exception to my knowledge, were lunar calendars initially. And then sometimes, like the Indian calendar, they try to reform themselves or become a kind of a hybrid between a lunar and a solar calendar so that they would not uh, be uh, constantly shifting away uh, from... This is why, for example, Diwali in, uh, if you, in the, on the Gregorian calendar, Diwali doesn't happen every year uh, on the same date. It keeps shifting. But then once in a while it jumps back because a correction has been and in that correction, which is an intercalary month, is already described in the Vedanga Jyotisham, though it works a bit differently. There is a calendar on Earth today, which is the Islamic calendar, which does not introduce a correction, it does not introduce an intercalary month, which is why the days of the Muslim festivals keep shifting constantly. They never jump back as uh, Diwali or, 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 you know, uh, Krishna Zemastami keep doing. You know, there will be a shift and then after a few years you will uh, find that they come back. So, so uh, this is, this is the these are the natural clocks. The solar year is not a, a very, it is of course a natural clock also and of course ancients noticed it. But it's not easy to measure things in terms of a year, you see. You, you have to, in, in a human life you need something which is much closer to our immediate future. So that's why basically uh, uh, they were c concerned with the calendar making and calendrical science is really a science. There are lots of techniques about it. And, and uh, if you study, if you want to study all of the Indian calendars and all the different kinds of them and uh, uh, the way they all correct themselves and so on, it's re it becomes very intricate. Now, how did they measure time? Because uh, the, the Viranga Jyotisha, for example, speaks of uh, units of time which go down to the Ghatika. Ghatika is the Indian hour. The hour of 60 minutes did not exist in India until the first millennium BC, probably after 500 BC, and it is supposed to be a, a, a Babylonian borrowing. Uh, so the Indians had the day, they had <coughs> the, of course, the Paksha, not again the month, uh, they had the lunar month, of course, the Paksha, the, the fortnight, they did not have the week. The seven-day week 
came again apparently from the Babylonians later. And for shorter units, the, the daily unit was the ghatika. And there were, of course, uh, 60 ghatikas of 24 minutes in a day. That is how the, the time was kept. And there were many other units in addition. Now, the, the way of measuring was with simple instruments like this initially. Uh, this is a water clock where you see this ball uh, floating on water, but it has a small hole in the center. And the hole is so calibrated, initially you'll have to do it through repeated trial and error, so calibrated that the ball will fill up, it will sink slowly, and it will be full after 24 minutes, and then you pick it up again and restart. So this is a simple water clock. You'll have to simply calibrate your hole to make sure that this happens 60 times in a day, from sunset to su sunset, for example, or sunrise to sunrise. So this is one of the later on during the classical me period, I won't go into that, there will be more sophisticated water clocks. Um, and then, of course, uh, different methods of time uh, keeping based on what today we call a sundial, you know, the shadow of a gnomon, that is a vertical stick. Uh, its shadow can also, with calculations, give you the time. Now, a little later, after the Venanga Jyotisha, there is, uh, and again, this, this was extensively covered by Amartya, so anyway, I'll just uh, uh, give you a little brief gist of it. A whole series of textbooks of geometry, which were intended to give instructions for the construction of Vedic altars. Now, as you know, in the Vedas, in the time of the Vedas, there are no temples, there are no murtis, you know, you don't worship a statue, as far as we know at least. There is fire worship, and you, ha you conduct fire sacrifices. And these fire sacrifices are supposed to, in the philosophical rationale for them, they are supposed to be replication of the original sacrifice of Prajapati, the creator, who sacrificed himself to create this universe. So, then they are basically sacrifices to the universe. But it's not very convenient to sacrifice to the whole universe. So you shrink the universe on a, a, a smaller size. And uh, you have symbolic altars like these, uh, where uh, you have uh, usually five layers. They are actually you know, representations of the cosmos. So you have five layers. The bottommost layer is explicitly the Earth, Higher, highest layer is the, the highest heaven, and in between you have the three intermediary worlds. So this is the, the philosophy behind, and you have various shapes like this uh, tortoise, but then there are constraints, and the constraint is that you can freely choose a different shape of altar. I'll show you just one or two. For example, the, you have a perfectly square altar. You have a perfectly circular altar. I think it is called uh, Ratacha. Rata Chakra Chitti, this is the Kurma Chitti, and um, the, the thing is that the area of the altar is fixed. It is seven and a half square Purusha. The Purusha in Shulva Sutras is a unit of length which is this, which is a man with his arm on top. So from the tip of my hand to the feet, this is a Purusha. And uh, so this is the area given for the altar, and you can so therefore, if you have to make sure that it is really respected, you have to make sure that you understand the area of each of your sh various shapes of bricks. And also to complicate things further, the, uh, no layer is allowed to be identical to the next. So you, the, sh the shapes of the bricks will change for a layer after layer. And yet five times, Actually, it is usually 200 bricks per layer, so you have 1,000 bricks in all. Five times you will repre repeat this equivalence for the surface, that it has to add up to seven and a half square purusha. So you have to therefore define a whole system of units, measure all of your bricks in this term, and understand the geometry of a triangle, of a trapezoid, of a square, of a rectangle, so that you can calculate those areas. And this is, of course, another shape very famous. You would have seen this symbol, but this is the Shena Chitti, Shena being the falcon, which, uh, uh, you know, as, as Amartya rightly explained, is the symbol of our soaring aspiration to the, to the heavens. 
And this is far more intricate shapes, as you can see. And again, from layer to layer, they're going to change. Now, the, the Shurva Sutras in brief, I'm not going to spend more time on them, are extremely interesting because they give a lot of geometrical constructions, purely geometrical, because you have to change the, you're free to change the shapes and you have to be able to calculate the, the area of various shapes of bricks, uh, which may be triangular, square, rectangular, semi-trapezoid, fully trapezoid, and so on. Uh, you have to be able to transform all these figures all the time. So they give you purely geometrical constructions to transform, for example, to double the size of a square. If you want to construct a square, which is twice the area of a particular square, they give you a geometrical procedure. It is not computational. You don't calculate anything. Uh, if you want to transform a square into a rectangle or vice versa, or uh, into a triangle, and they even attempted, so all those procedures are perfect. They are absolutely correct. You can replicate them. Uh, they are very good exercises, in fact, in geometry. We could use them at, uh, you know, uh, class uh, 5, 6, 7 uh, level. But uh, then they also pro propose uh, procedures to transform a circle into a square and vice versa. You know the old problems that you, um, um, uh, medieval Europe confronted for centuries, they called this the problem of the circulature of the square or the squaring of the circle until in the 19th century they discovered that it couldn't be done. There is no uh, exact geometric procedure because of the transcendental nature of pi. So, so, but anyway, we have in that case still uh, reasonably good approximations. So this shows simply that, see, the, the initial impulse here is people would say religious, okay, whatever, let us say ritual rather. You, you want to conduct a fire worship in a very, very, uh, uh, you know, systematically thought out ma manner where you are aware of the whole symbolism of your altars. But then this leads you to very rigorous geometrical procedures, which, uh, which in fact uh, are often thought, especially by uh, Seidenberg, an American uh, uh, historian of, uh, of science, of mathematics in particular. Uh, his analysis was that because of the non-computational nature of Shulba Sutras, uh, they were probably, they represented probably the oldest uh, uh, type of geometry, certainly uh, not exactly older than the Greeks, but the fact that to him the Greek geometry, which is completely axiomatic and with a lot of computations, uh, must uh, have derived, and the Babylonian also, which was basically computational, must have derived from an older geometry, which is akin he says, akin to that of the Shulba Sutras. He doesn't say that it is the Shulba Sutras because he doesn't know. You know, then he has to depend on the historians, on the archaeologists, on the linguists, and it becomes a whole uh, controversial issue. So, but, but this is uh, probably the earliest type of geometry. And we get a lot of reasons. I won't uh, spend more time on, on Shulba Sutras. I just want, of course, to show this famous case of the so-called Pythagoras theorem, which actually is due to Euclid, not to Pythagoras. We don't have any works by Pythagoras. And uh, here, the Shulba Sutras, which are dated conservatively to 500, 600 BC, possibly 800 BC. Uh, so in any case, before Euclid, there's no doubt that Shulba Sutras are, are, are much older than Euclid. And you have, again, in purely geometrical terms, no, no, not algebraical terms, you can read for yourself uh, how in Bodhayana Shulba Sutras, this is one of the four major Shulba Sutras that have come down to us. There were more forms which have disappeared. How the expression is put, you see, you can read the text and you can see how I illustrated it. And it's purely geometric. There is no A square plus B square equals C square. That language does not exist yet. So, so uh, this is something quite non-controversial. In fact, the Babylonians also knew, in any case, this theorem as early as, uh, uh, according to uh, the dates that scholars give us, uh, uh, as early as 1800 BC. Uh, we have a Babylonian tablet, it's fairly well known, where actually there is a construction with a square and two diagonals, and the expression is very clearly given. Uh, so, so this was something which, in any case, was known long before 
Pythagoras. There would be a lot more to say on the Shulba Sutras, but I have to cover quite a few other areas. I just want here to show you the uh, system of linear units which Shulba Sutras used to do all their uh, uh, calculation of areas for the bricks in particular. There were still some, there were some calculations, but the, the geometrical procedures were not based on calculations. This was just for measurements of the bricks. And um, uh, as you can see, we start from the angular. Rather, we start from the anu. Anu later on comes to mean an atom. But in the Shulva Sutras, it refers to a grain of millet. So it's, of course, very small. And the angular is usually considered to be the width of the middle uh, finger. So these are basically units based on the physical body. And this is, again, something common to all ancient civilizations. You very naturally start from the human body because it's so convenient. Then you can use your hands or your, or your feet to measure things out. Though, of course, there will be irregularities. It will not be rigorously standardized. Standardization will come later. So you have two kind of uh, feet, uh, the 12 uh, angular, the 15 angular. You have the aratni, which uh, later will be called the hasta, which is this. It is In English, it is called the cubit. And then you have further units, including the purusha, which I told you later on in Arthashastra, uh, which is datable to probably 4th century BC. So that would be a few centuries later. We have more, uh, uh, more or less a similar system, but already more standardized. And some units have changed slightly. So it is no longer the millet, but the barley. That would be, of course, a local phenomenon. Uh, in fact, even in South India, we have angulas, you know, uh, for example, de de defined on grains of rice. So it depends what crop you have, of course. Uh, so, but in, in, in Cortilia's text, it is the barley. And then you keep building up. So you have the, this Danur Graha is this, the four angulas. And then the Vitasti is, is this. It is the span of the hand. And you can yourself measure your cubit, your individual hasta, or, or aratni as it is called, still called aratni also. You can see that it is twice. Well, for me, it's a bit long, longer. But we are not uh, standardized, luckily, uh, I suppose. Uh, so, so this is how the whole thing is defined. And then you have the danda or dhanus of 96. Uh, Angular, sometimes 108 angulas for other purposes. And the Purusha now has shrunk from 120 to 108. So I mean, there will be then many other systems in the classical mathematicians. They will give such, uh, 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 they will often enumerate the, the units they are using. There will be minor variations here and there. But this is, broadly speaking, what happens. In fact, in other sciences, non-mathematical sciences like iconometry, the, the art of measuring out statues, which the Stapatis, the, the uh, uh, Shilpis, if you prefer, uh, use, they use very rigorous proportions and uh, units. And here, the Tala, that is to say, the unit that gives the rhythm, this is you know, the same word as in classical music. Of course, you have recognized it. And it is exactly a question of rhythm, but in, in, in a in, in three dimensions and not in the sound anymore. And here, for example, you can see on the right, uh, all these, most of these statues are defined on the basis of the, uh, the hand span, the vitasti, uh, the 12 angulas. So anyway, this is just to show you that there are other applications beyond. About the same time, we have giant texts of mathematics and astronomy, <coughs> which uh, I won't go about, which are uh, uh, heavily mythologized, they are very much based on uh, the conception of the universe of the Jains. Uh, the Buddhists have some elements of mathematics, but almost no astronomy for reasons which I have not yet clearly understood. The Buddhists were apparently not very interested in astronomy, whereas the Jains were very much, and the Hindus also, of course. But here in this Buddhist text, uh, there is a uh, a, a, a metaphorical uh, passage which speaks of the heavens of Indra. And uh, it describes uh, uh, Indra is actually you know, has joined the Buddhist pantheon by that time. And these heavens of Indra, 
uh, are described as a place with networks of pearls where in each pearl you can see the reflection of all the others and in those reflections, you know like when you put two mirrors face to face and you try to peep in between, you can see those reflections endlessly. Now, it looks like a poetical metaphor and nothing else, but number one, number one, a group of American mathematicians, one of them is David Mumford, who has also taken an interest in uh, Indian mathematics, uh, studied, they took it up as a challenge, and they said, are there mathematical structures that actually meet this condition? And they found that in group mathematics, there is a particular Schottky group where several structures will actually fulfill these conditions. You, have, you can see two of them here where every little white uh, yellow uh, dot, of course it gets all fused together here, every little yellow dot uh, fulfills the condition spelled out by this Buddhist text. So it's an interesting exercise, but then there may be something more to it because one day I was reading the biography of this brilliant quantum physicist David Bohm, who uh, some of you might know was very deeply interested in understanding the deeper nature of this universe of matter, the deeper laws behind quantum physics, you know, so, so, so that the order of the universe would emerge. And he had an interest in Indian thought. He collaborated with Krishnamurti for some time. Uh, he was really trying to go a little deeper. And he was somebody who once in a while had visions, which is something that, you know, scientists normally don't boast <laughs> too much about because it won't look too good. But his biographer notes this vision, which came to him in the form of a large number of highly silvered spherical mirrors that reflected each other. The universe was composed of this infinity of reflections and of reflections of reflections. Every atom was reflecting in this way and the infinity of these reflections was reflected in each thing is each was an infinite reflection of the whole. Now, when I read that, I remembered that Buddhist text of 2000, <clears throat> maybe 1800 or 2000 years earlier, which I'm sure David Baum would not have known. And it's just amazing how, you know, the, the, the two, uh, and, and this vision came to Baum when he was actually meditating, contemplating on the deeper uh, reality of, of this world. So anyway, these are, as I said, uh, here we are, you know, we have a fuzzy borderline between science and, and other things. We don't know even what to call them. The Buddhist uh, text is simply, you would take it simply as a mythological text, you know, the heavens of Indra, pure mythology. So apparently no science, and then you don't know in the end. You don't know for sure. Now coming back to harder science, this is also the time uh, when uh, at the time of Ashoka, for example, second column, uh, we get uh, inscriptions for the first time in India uh, with the Brahmi script. And uh, you've heard, of course, of the edicts of Ashoka. And uh, then uh, what's interesting is that as part of these inscriptions, numeral, numerals come. For the first time, we have numerals. Well, perhaps the script has numerals. It's actually quite likely. But, well, since it's not deciphered, we can't say for sure. And you can even, uh, you know, recognize some shapes uh, which uh, look fairly familiar. Uh, there are other, uh, this is all in Brahmi, in fact. Uh, there is another script contemporary called the Karoshti script. And you can see one thing immediately, that these, these numerals, though they resemble, and indeed, indeed, they will be the numerals that will slowly be uh, altered in all the Indian alphabets and will be borrowed by the Arabs with further modifications and will eventually migrate to Europe with still further no modifications and this is what will create uh, the so-called Arabic numerals. But they are, there is no controversy at least about this. It's well known everywhere that they are of Indian origin. And that is why if you compare, for example, the Devanagari or the Bengali numerals, uh, with the, the Arabic numerals, you can immediately uh, draw certain parallels. But the important point here. This one? Yeah. If you have to write it with a stroke of pen, yes. it automatically This one? Yeah. Trying to connect them. 
it looks to me more like Roman numbers. You see, this is actually the natural origin of Roman numbers. You just keep repeating the stroke. Yeah, but, but what I'm saying is that once it has come to this form, huh. Roman is uh, vertical. Is yeah, it is vertical. And, and, and Ashokam Brahmi, it is also vertical. So it depends. No, from this uh, horizontal thing, huh. Huh. that our present three, huh. oh. Okay, 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 okay. Uh, yes, okay. yes. It, it might well be, it might well be. But to be very sure, we would have to trace the whole epigraphic evolution, which has been done. Uh, I, have, I don't remember for three, uh, but we would have to trace it because... Uh, just, uh, just two or three, no? no, it's true, but sometimes, for example, you take four, and you say, you can say it looks so much like our four, you just have to add this, but actually not at all. If you look at the epigraphic evolution of this Brahmi form, it goes through all kinds of funny, funny, funny shapes and eventually gets simplified in Europe and comes to our, which coincidentally looks like this one, but it is sheer coincidence. So, uh, well, it's the same. Devnagari or Arabic will be the same. So, no, you may have a point. What I say is that to be absolutely sure, we have to go through the whole uh, evolution in India. But my important remark here is that look at this number 2. It is written as 1-1. One, one. This is the principle of Roman numbers. It is not written as a, a, a separate symbol. Or look at, for example, see this you can see we are almost in a context of Roman numbers. Except that this, this x happens to be 4 in Karoshti. So you don't write 8, you write 4-4. Four, four. So in other words, this is not a good numeral system as we understand it today. It is not a decimal place value system of numeral notation as we have today. This is going to come a little later in India. I'm coming to that. So this is what we call a non-positional system. In the texts of mathematics and astronomy, especially a few centuries later, there will, be, there will be several practices, many practices in fact. Sometimes you will find authors using numerals, but you see numerals were not standardized across India. Even when we get to the real full-fledged full uh, decimal system, the numerals will be varying from region to region. So if they wanted to be understood across India, they rather used words. And of course you have these Sanskrit words, but then when you're going to have, for example, uh, something like 10,000, it's not very convenient to, uh, to say eka shunya 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 and these kind of jarring repetitions were against the poetical sense of Sanskrit. So therefore they varied the names for the, the, those numerals and if you find for example in, in a text of mathematics if you find Ashwin it, does, it has nothing to do with the gods it means two or if you find Guna it means three if you find uh, uh, yoga, of course, because of the Chatur Yogas, you find four, etc. So you have actually quite a big chunk of Hindu mythology uh, embedded in the way uh, uh, numbers were named sometimes. Now finally, finally we get to, and this is the first uncontested uh, inscription with uh, a, a real full-fledged decimal system of numeral notation as we use it today. This is three, so you have a point here, uh, Amartya, because yes, there are three strokes connected vertically, and this seems to be like a good intermediary, but again, we will have to build it up, build up the whole chain. And this is four, and this is six, but that is in a local era in Gujarat, in Sankheda, in the Baruch uh, region of Gujarat, and uh, <coughs> uh, when you translate into the Orion, uh, this is what it gives. But there are several candidates to earlier dates and we know for sure that uh, by the time of Aryabhatta, in fact, uh, the, the uh, decimal system is fully in place, though he is not, uh, he's not using it himself, I will show you in a moment. Uh, there are stories uh, to illustrate this uh, coming of the decimal system of numeral notation and the power of it and one of them, which comes to us mainly for Persian sources, is the story of uh, Sesa and the chess game. But I've heard a very similar story in Kerala uh, at the 
uh, that is attached to one temple and one king, and I've uh, noted it down, uh, it's almost identical. So uh, there are very likely Indian sources for this Persian story. And the story, very briefly, is that one Brahmin goes to a, a, a king and demonstrates, explains, teaches the king to play chess. And the king is so delighted with this uh, uh, very uh, innovative game that he tells the Brahmin to name a reward. He says, you tell me whatever you want, I'll give you. And the Brahmin says, you please give me, your majesty, one grain of rice on the first box, two on the second, uh, square four, and keep doubling like this every box. So the king says, uh, are you crazy? Can't you ask for something a little more substantial, like gold or jewels or something? And the Brahmin says, no, your majesty, that will be sufficient for me. <laughs> so this, the king asks his mathematicians to calculate how many bags of rice is that? But then, you see, that is where the story becomes interesting. It is a kingdom which still is using a pre-decimal system numeral of place value notation, which means something like Roman numbers. If you try to do these sums with Roman numbers, it is a pain. After the, f f the, 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 the eighth or ninth square, it will, you will just give up because it is so painful. It is feasible, but it will take ages, and that's what the king found out. So he said, what do we do? I'm going to lose my face. And uh, then one of them said, we've heard that in the neighboring kingdom, they have introduced a new system, which is our full-fledged decimal system of place value notation. And that permits fast calculation. So they get a mathematician from there who has no difficulty calculating that the total number of grain is this. This is maybe an exercise, I don't know, for class 10, or I, I'm not very sure. Uh, you can easily calculate this total number. So the king is said, very well, how many bags of rice is that? And then the mathematician says, Your Majesty, you've been taken for a ride. Uh, if you were to sow the entire earth and harvest it, you'll have to do it at least 70 times to get this number of grains of rice. So this is to illustrate the power of the... And then there are many different endings. There are several variants of the story. The ending I like best. In one ending, the Brahmin's head is chopped off, but that doesn't help us. Uh, the, the best ending is that the mathematician tells the king, you just open your granary, send the Brahmin inside, and ask him not to stop counting until he has reached this number, which, of course, will be many, many, many times the age of the universe, as you can immediately see. If you, if you could even count 10 grains per second, you can, I mean, work it out. Right, so, so this is, these are some of the preliminaries that take us to the classical or Siddhantic period of Indian science, where we have many of these great uh, savants uh, in blue here on the map, which I have adapted from a map uh, prepared by the St. Andrews University of Scotland. They have an excellent website on history of mathematics uh, with many, many Indian mathematicians. Uh, it's a shame that not a single Indian university has <laughs> the least bit of data on uh, uh, Indian mathematicians. But if you access the St. Andrews website, you will see this. I've adapted it a little bit. And here you see some of the leading names. And you see, incidentally, I'll come back to that if I'm not running too late. Otherwise, I'll try to catch up on Monday. Uh, you see, in particular, okay, Aryabhata here uh, at uh, Pataliputra, which was called Kusumapura in his days. You see Brahmagupta near Mount Abu, Varamira possibly around uh, Ujjain, uh, Bhaskara the first in Gujarat, Bhaskara the second, uh, somewhere between Maharashtra and uh, northern Karnataka. The place is a bit disputed. And as you proceed, you have to move further in time. As you proceed in time, you can see that you have to, barring certain pockets which remain, especially in Maharashtra, Varanasi also has some you have to move further south. So you have uh, Mahavira, who is a very brilliant, very brilliant Jain mathematician. And finally, you have a school known as the Kerala School of Mathematics and Astronomy. Some of you might have heard of it. Uh, we had, in fact, uh, one or two talks today uh, in the, this uh, Sandhi workshops about it. And uh, you see, therefore, there is a downward movement. Now, I'm not going to, because it would be impossible, it was not really my objective. I'm not going to run you through all these mathematicians. Uh, there are many books, brilliant papers, and so on. I can just illustrate. I can just take Aryabhata, the first Siddhantic Siddhanta 
is a technical term which means a treatise or a, a bunch of principles uh, uh, which is put in a book form. So Aryabhata uh, writes his Aryabhatiya and uh, <clears throat> we know the date because he gives it to us in an indirect manner. And as you can see, he creates his own language. And this is a language, uh, uh, it's an artificial notation, where, which I've explained here briefly. I have just, uh, uh, you, you can see, I, I won't explain, doesn't matter. Where you can use syllables and vowels of Sanskrit in a way that can correspond exactly. It's a one-to-one -one mapping with real numbers. And um, I, not <laughs> real in the mathematical sense, with uh, integrals, in fact, uh, integral numbers. And, uh, and uh, here he's actually giving us in a very concise way. Now, why did he use this language, which actually is not even a truly decibel system? Uh, it's, it's a little unclear. Perhaps he was not satisfied with what was available around him. Or anyway, we don't know who developed it. But um, we also know that he knew the full-fledged decimal uh, system. I'll tell you how in a moment. So here he is actually building a table of sign values. You see, all these mathematicians were also doing astronomy. And in astronomy, you have a lot of trigonometry, which leads you to sines, cosines, tangents, and so on. And you need to have the value of the sines of angles. So from three, he divides the quadrant into 24. And therefore, from 3.75 to 90, he gives all the values in incremental. He starts from 3.75, gives the values, and says how much you must add to get the next 3.75 uh, angle away. So when you calculate it all, which is not difficult, it's a bit tedious, but uh, it has been done, there's no problem, you get, uh, in fact, the fact that uh, all of them are correct to the fourth or fifth decimal. So quite a good accuracy. And <clears throat> But we will see shortly that there are even better ways. So anyway, uh, uh, he did many other things. Sorry? Huh. Huh. This is it. It is the this. What does Maki mean? It has a meaning. It doesn't have a meaning. It's a nonsense. It's nonsense. This is nonsensical. You have to translate ma and ki back into numbers. Yeah, that, that's what These means. are numbers. I mentioned it. Yeah, so, uh, no, it, it is related, I suppose, with this one, with this system. It is the system. Yeah. This is the system he uses to produce this kind of pseudo language, which is nothing but. Uh, numbers expressed in syllables. So it is nonsense, but you can easily memorize it. Huh. You can easily memorize it. You see, for a student, maki, baki, bhaki, daki, etc., is easy to memorize. Maybe, in fact, it could be one of the reasons why this was worked out, possibly. And, uh, but you can really see in the end uh, this kala uh, arda jia and arda. This is jia. I forgot to explain. This is the chord of this. Uh, a full angle in, in green, but the, to the credit of the Indians came the idea of splitting this chord into two. The, the Greeks were struggling with the full chord, which is not very easy to use. Uh, the Indians split it into two, and then of course now you can recognize that if you take the radius as one unit, then this ardajia is going to be the sine value. Uh, this is, uh, this is the, the opposite side and you don't even have to divide by the hypotenuse because you, you just say that this is one unit. So that way it is quite simple. So this is uh, uh, the first Indian table of signs and uh, well there are many other things he did. Uh, he gave an approximate value of pi which you can see not too bad but he was aware apparently that it was still approximate and this value of pi is going to be a recurrent problem with all following mathematicians uh, in India, and uh, uh, we, will, uh, we will see later some other example. Um, area of the triangle and uh, uh, various surfaces, various volumes, but the volumes of the sphere and the pyramid were wrong. The formulas it gives were wrong. Uh, I, I, in fact, I'll come back to the sphere in a minute. Uh, it's always important, you see, uh, to, to note where they, they also make mistakes, because they always make some mistakes here and there. 
And it's not that we're trying to run down Aryabhata, not at all, but it helps us all the more to understand uh, you know, the, 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 the fact that this was a progressive discovery of knowledge. This is cumulative knowledge from mathematician to mathematician, and it's quite natural to discover uh, uh, errors in that. And we have, you know, sometimes people in India who want to uh, excessively uh, uh, glorify these uh, great savants by, uh, you know, projecting them as omniscient, and actually it is a kind of a disservice. It is far more instructive to see how they progressively refined their knowledge. Square roots and cube roots can be extracted through precise uh, uh, algorithm, and this is how we know that uh, he knew the full-fledged decimal system, because you can't use his algorithms with his numeral system. It won't work. It's not possible. And the fact, uh, very important, I mean, I, I, I have to, uh, there are many, many more things in his Arya Bhatia. Uh, these are just small samples. The fact that it was one of the texts that were, received the largest number of commentaries in India. You see, um, some of these Siddhantas, most of them are very brief. Aryabhatiya is just 131 shlokas. It can be printed in perhaps 10 pages. So the, the language is so succinct that many times you can't even understand what, what he's trying to say. These are highly summarized and compact formulas. So very often we depend on the commentaries by later savants to explain uh, in full. And this is uh, why uh, we, we have uh, uh, thankfully so many of them. He was translated into Arabic and from Arabic into Latin. And he even had a Latin name uh, in, the, in medieval Europe, which was Ardabarius. Uh, in astronomy, he did quite a lot of things. He um, uh, propounded, first of all, the theory that the uh, Earth was a rotating sphere hanging in space and that this was what created uh, the apparent motion of the Sun. He's not saying that the Earth goes around the Sun or vice versa. He's not dealing with this at all. He just says that this is a sphere hanging in space. Unfortunately, his successors, and especially Brahmagupta and Varahamira, will reject this and Brahmagupta, in fact, was a very, very brilliant uh, scientist, but sometimes maybe a little overconfident and arrogant. And he even writes that this Aryabhata knows nothing about mathematics and astronomy. And he rejects this for the simple reason that if a bird leaves its nest early in the morning and wants to come back to its nest in the evening, and the Earth has rotated 180 degrees in between, then it cannot find its nest again. But the argument is not as silly as you might think. And you know, in fact, you need 19th century physics with all the theory of frames of reference and so on to give a full answer, to meet the challenge completely. So unfortunately, this notion will be abandoned. Um, it, well, it gives a dimension for the Earth about 12% too large, which is not too bad. But the Greeks had done it centuries earlier. So, and and Aryabhata does not explain anything, so we don't know how he gets to this measurement, and uh, uh, whether it is his or somebody else's. The dimensions of the uh, uh, Earth and the Moon are not bad, but then the planets, uh, the diameters he gives for the planets, and especially for the Sun, are way off the real thing. So once again, it's useful to note uh, that uh, it, it simply shows that the planetary model he was working uh, uh, from was not adequate. On the other hand, very correct interpretation of the mechanism of eclipses. The moon eclipses the sun, and the great shadow of the earth eclipses the moon. Um, I'll take a few more minutes. I won't be able to conclude today, but it doesn't matter. Monday, we will, uh, I will uh, because there are a few important things I wanted to say at the end. Uh, I'll still uh, simply run through a, few, a couple more uh, scientists, and uh, we will close it for today. So, but then, you see what's interesting in particular, is that, so Aryabhata gives you a lot of dry formula about uh, signs and surfaces and volumes and the motions of the planets and how to calculate uh, the, the, the uh, uh, position of uh, the moon and the sun in the sky according to certain coordinate systems and all that. I mean, it's just the kind of stuff you would, the best possible stuff you would expect from his days. But then suddenly out of the blue, 
there are two things he says. Well, one we can still understand. He says time is without beginning or end. Uh, this is an important statement because this is not going to be something that Europe can consider till the 19th century. Uh, the the, the Judeo-Christian world in particular, time has a beginning. This is the creation, Genesis. And it will have an end when the world is finally destroyed. So, so uh, this is a different uh, you know, cultural uh, uh, framework which we have to understand. But then what strikes me even more is that knowing this no motion of the earth and the planets on the celestial sphere, one attains the supreme Brahman after piercing through the orbits of the planets and the stars. And this is totally like, you know, unexpected. Uh, he doesn't connect it with the previous uh, shloka or the following shloka, it's just out of the blue. And what exactly he is trying to say, well, it's for you to uh, meditate upon, but he, this seems to be an implication that, you know, the contemplation of this vast, possibly infinite universe uh, is, is, uh, is, is basically a spiritual experience. This is what I understand from it. So you can see that these uh, scientists also move in a certain um, uh, philosophical or spiritual framework. Uh, Brahma Gupta is one of the great next figures. Yes? Just in support of your speculation. Yes? After Aryabhata, there is Lalla. Huh. Explicitly says that uh, by studying the celestial sphere, you get moksha. I mean, yes, yes. And I believe it is just an elaboration upon Aryabhata. Yes. But then later on, we don't hear much this kind of language later on. Brahma Gupta, I don't think he will. Brahma yeah. Lalla. Lalla, yes, I understand. Now, uh, coming to Brahma Gupta, uh, he, as I said, was a very brilliant, gifted uh, mathematician and astronomer. Uh, the, it's impossible to list all the innovations he brought, especially in algebra, methods of calculation, of uh, uh, solutions, especially. The, these mathematicians were, were very much looking at integral solutions of equations. You would lay an equation, for example, e ax plus by uh, equals c, or sometimes second degree, and you would look not for real or rationally even solutions, but for integral solutions, integers. Why? Because these were actually astronomical problems where we, you were looking for an integral number of revolution in a given age or, 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 or things like that. And uh, so now this uh, development of uh, looking for integral solutions, you cannot get to them. There's no formula to, to work them out instantly. You have to work them out only through algorithms. So Aryabhata was already dealing with a very simple case of uh, first uh, degree. Then Brahmagupta took up the second degree. This will be further refined by Bhaskaracharya. And in fact, this is one major contribution of, uh, in, in this way, you know, many foundations of algebra were laid. But Brahmagupta also innovated by uh, uh, introducing in India for the first time negative and even working out all the rules. You know, a negative number to a positive number. Uh, it is all not, not algebraic notation. What happens if you add a negative number to another negative number? If you subtract a negative number from a negative number, the whole thing, multiplication also, etc. So the whole thing is worked out. And then, then he ventured further by, for the first time in Indian mathematics, and I believe worldwide. I think negative numbers, the Chinese had them possibly a little earlier. But this notion of mathematical infinity, I think this is a world first, where he tries to grasp, because Indians, as I've already indicated, and I will come back to this next time, uh, were playing with colossal numbers all the time out of a kind of intellectual exercise. So they also looked uh, at, you know, where does it end and what is, what is this thing that allows us to, to continue indefinitely. So they came to this notion of infinite and Brahmagupta, which of course existed as a philosophical concept, just had you, as you had Shunya, zero existing or emptiness already existing as a philosophical concept, but now it becomes mathematical. And Brahma Gupta says, that which is divided by zero, ka is zero, it is the sky. And whatever is plenitude, totality, 
is, means zero in Indian mathematics. Uh, so, ka uh, cheda, that which is divided by the zero, is the infinite. Now, of course, in mathematics, you, modern mathematics, you will have to slightly alter the definition and you know, uh, turn it into limits. But, uh, um, but uh, Georges Ifra, the French historian of mathematics, uh, reflects that a thousand years ahead of Europeans, Indian savants knew that the zero and infinity were mutually inverse notions. So, I will uh, take just two, two more minutes uh, to deal with Bhaskara the first, uh, who followed, uh, who was actually contemporary with uh, Brahmagupta and who authored a monumental commentary on Aryabhatta. Uh, he was basically a, a disciple or at least an admirer of uh, uh, Aryabhatta. And he attributes to Aryabhatta, even though we don't have it in Aryabhatta's text, but then we know that there are at least one or two other texts by Aryabhatta which have disappeared. He attributes uh, this uh, rational approximation of the sine function. Now, this is funny because you might not have thought easy to get a rational function to approximate the sine. But then, as I said, these astronomers needed sine values all the time. So even table of signs were cumbersome because you would have to interpolate all the time. You have only a few values, and if your anger is in between, you will have to work it out. So this takes time. So what if we had a formula, simple, that we give us, it give us instantly sign values. Now through some process which uh, is not explained but has been kind of reconstructed by mathematicians, he gives us this value which actually never exceeds 0.16, This is the map, the, the curve of it which I drew with the help of a student, where actually we had two uh, uh, lift uh, the sign value by, by 0 0.05, you see it's lifted a bit, right? Because if we had not lifted it, they would be almost indistinguishable on this graph. So to make you be better understand the coincidence, we have uh, pushed up this uh, sign and, and you can see that between 0 and 180 degrees, there is almost perfect coincidence. Now this is amazing and this is the kind of thing that uh, Indians were very good at that is to say, and I will, I will close on this for today, and I will uh, resume on Monday, I will uh, somehow manage, uh, which is to say that um, they were extremely good at computations, things that gave brilliant, effective results, fast working algorithms, even uh, Lagrange, when he was trying to extract integral solutions to a certain equation, which uh, uh, I think Bhaskaracharya had already worked out. Uh, his algorithms were, were not so f f fast. They, were, they had more steps. So uh, this was one thing where the Indians excelled. And we will discuss next time briefly, when, uh, along with uh, some uh, technologies which I would like to highlight. We will discuss next time on Monday evening uh, this contrast between Greek way of doing science which, is, which was very axiomatic. You know how Euclid lays down axioms and then all the theorems have to be logically and rigorously derived from them. Whereas the Indians were not really concerned with axiomatics. They do not give initial axioms uh, you know, from which everything else has to be. But they were excellent at computational methods, algorithms, uh, uh, algebra, trigonometry, uh, all, all these uh, fundament, uh, equally important elements of um, a science. So I will, I will uh, end today with this. It's already a bit late. And uh, we'll continue this on, on Monday. Uh, there are some uh, interesting things to consider on the evolution of Indian mathematics and astronomy. And I will also try to deal with the, you know, the, the, the major problem, the major question which is always asked and a kind of reproach made to Indian science that you know, if Indian mathematicians and astronomers had so much, and we will see that there is a lot more when we come to the Kerala school. Why, did, why uh, is it that modern mathematics and modern uh, uh, physics did not evolve right here in India? Why did it have to take place in Europe? It's a very complex question. I'll only give a few elements of answers and just to you know, uh, bring the problem alive, nothing more. So for today, thank you very much. And, uh, <laughs>